Hi, I'm a possum and I find garbage. Today's garbage is The Predator, the terribly named fourth movie in the Predator series, or sixth if you count those Aliens vs. Predator movies. It was directed and co-written by Shane Black, the guy who played Hawkins in the original Predator. Jeez, you got a big I wasn't even sure that guy was still alive before he decided to crawl out from underneath whatever refrigerator he was living under all this time to puppeteer the corpse of this franchise. But then I found out he co-wrote the screenplay for Iron Man 3. You know, the one everyone hated. So I guess when he's not sleeping with Disney executives for the chance to botch the Mandarin, Shane Black is sleeping with Fox executives for the chance to botch Predator. At least they didn't pull Schwarzenegger out of his coffin for this like, they, like Paramount keeps doing for Terminator. Like they think people want to see a sad old man past his prime play sidekick to some post-menopausal woman who looks like she's waiting to complain to the manager. But I'm getting off topic. Just like this franchise, which used to be about an alien who hunts humans for sport, and then morphed into some embarrassing schlock about aliens collecting human DNA for reasons that don't make sense. Alright, that's enough intro, let's just get into it. The movie starts with Predator, the Predator spaceship being chased by another spaceship. It escapes through a wormhole and arrives at Earth, but it appears that it's about to, to crash. The Predator casually walks to his escape pod, passing by a thing the camera zooms in on to let us know it's important. The Predator escapes his spaceship, and then we cut to a jungle. There's actually a pretty neat shot where the camera pans over and then pans, pans back to reveal our main character, Quinn McKenna, hiding in the bushes. Quinn is some kind of American army sniper on a black ops mission in Mexico. He gets distracted by the Predator's escape pod about to crash on top of him, so he takes his shot, then runs faster than an Alabama girl runs from her brothers. Quinn rolls down a hill and blacks out like my mom on a Saturday night, but then wakes up with basically no sign of injury, and then he finds the wreckage of the escape pod and the Predator's mask. Then another army guy shows up and gives Quinn a backpack to hide the mask in, then Quinn finds the Predator's arm thing, and even though he has no idea what it is, he decides to put it on his arm. Predictably, it clamps down on his arm, but then he, they hear something in the trees. A dead body comes flopping down, and Quinn recognizes it as his army buddy, even though his face is cut off. Maybe he's really familiar with some other parts of his body, I don't know. Then the Predator briefly uncloaks himself for no reason other than to let the audience know that an action scene's about to happen. So I guess the Predator fell out of the escape pod or something as it was crashing and somehow didn't die. Why else would he have left his mask and arm thing by the escape pod? Wait, wasn't he wearing those when he, before he got in the escape pod? How'd they end up there? So Quinn and the, uh, the other army guy try shooting at the Predator, but the Predator kills the army guy. And then he, he gets up on a rock and just stands there so our hero can conveniently shoot a thing for, from the arm thing and knock the Predator out. The blood from the hanging body drips onto the Predator, revealing him. Now, even though the fact that the Predator's eyes shouldn't be visible here because they don't have blood on them, if you, you, if you can make the Predator visible just by splashing something on him, then wouldn't that render his cloaking device borderline useless in the jungle where he would inevitably get covered in mud? How does his cloaking device work anyway? I mean, it turns him invisible, but it also turns his clothes invisible. So, does it make everything touching him invisible? Well, obviously not, because then the trees around him become invisible when he touch them. So I guess the cloak somehow intelligently discriminates which things that are in contact with him to make invisible. So why wouldn't it be programmed to make fluids that get spilled on him invisible? We see in the first Predator that makes his own blood invisible, so why not other people's blood? That seems like a pretty big design flaw when you consider his favorite method of killing involves running up close and stabbing people with a giant claw. Does the Predator also carry a towel around? Anyway, the Predator wakes back up, so Quinn runs away and sees a helicopter approaching. Then the arm thing spits out a little metal ball for no reason. Then Quinn continues running. Then the helicopter lands and we're introduced to our bad guy, Bad black guy. We get a close-up of his Nicorette gum, which is to imply that this is important, but it never gets brought up again for the rest of the movie. Then we cut to some Mexican village. Quinn walks into a bar and tells the guy to help him, and just to prove he's not messing around, he uses the little metal ball thing to turn himself invisible. 
How does that thing work anyway? You just hold it and it sometimes makes you make it invisible? Quinn tells the guy to mail the contents of his backpack to his P.O. box in the United States. Then he pours himself a drink and swallows the invisibility ball, while the sound of the police busting down the door plays in the background. I guess they forgot to film that. We then cut to some American middle school where a bunch of kids are playing chess in what looks like a science classroom for some reason. Then we see this kid watch the other kids playing. But then the, these two stereotypical bully characters pull the fire alarm. The kid starts freaking out and everyone, including the teacher, just leave the obviously special needs kid there alone. Then the two bullies see him and come in, but they don't really do anything but point out that he has Asperger syndrome. Really, they just kind of stand and look at him, then leave, but not before knocking over all the chess pieces. Asperger kid gets up and puts all the pieces back where they were, because according to movies, having Asperger syndrome gives you superhuman mental abilities. You know, if I had Asperger syndrome, I wouldn't find this flattering. I would be insulted by a movie portraying my mental disability inaccurately. Don't worry, it gets a lot dumber. So Asperger kid walks home and a dog barks at him. Then he makes it back to his house where he finds a note from his mom threatening to cut him if he makes a mess. Then the mailman shows up and asks him if Quinn lives there, and explains his P.O.B. box payments are past due, so they just sent his package to his house. I'm not sure that's how that works, but in any case, it turns out Quinn is Asperger Kid's father. He kills people, so you can be a mailman. Then we cut to Johns Hopkins University, Maryland, and we know that's where it is because the movie gives us that cliche action movie text in the lower left corner. Some government guys walk up to our next main character, Dr. Woman, and tell her to come with them. They show Dr. Woman some photos of the Predator and his spaceship, and explain the Predator first showed up in 1987, and again in 1997. They've been here before. 87, 97. Which is to apply the first two movies are still canon. Make a note of that. The government guy explains that Predator sightings have been increasing in frequency in recent years. And then we come back to Asperger Kid's house as his mom gets home. Mom shows Asperger Kid some cheap dollar store masks she bought for him for Halloween. But he says he doesn't like them because the other kids will still be able to tell who he is. So I guess he gets bullied a lot. Cut to the US Department of Veterans Affairs, where Quinn is being interrogated about what he knows about the Predator. Quinn realizes they're planning to pin the deaths of his squad on him to cover up the Predator. And then we cut back to Asperger Kid opening the package in his bedroom in the basement. I guess he waited until nighttime to do that. So he opens the box and finds the Predator's mask, which looks like it's made of plastic, and the arm thing. He plays around with it until a thing pops off and starts making holograms. Because futuristic devices always have to make holograms in movies. Never mind the fact that you wouldn't be able to see them in bright sunlight for the same reason it's hard to see a video projection in bright sunlight. Which <laughs> makes them impractical for an alien hunter who spends most of his time outdoors. Then we cut to Quinn being led out of the Veterans Affairs building to a prison bus where he meets our disposable one-note sidekick characters. This scene is the modern equivalent of the helicopter scene in the original Predator, where we're introduced to Schwarzenegger's Special Forces team. If you watch that scene, you might notice there's actually not that, that much dialogue. We learn about the characters' personalities based on how they act, and what they say to each other. Right off the bat, we get that Hawkins is the nerdy one who tells bad jokes. We get that Billy is the quiet and serious one. We get that Blaine is the big tough one, and that he doesn't respect Dylan the former Special Forces guy turned CIA pencil pusher. We learn all of this about these characters in a minute or so without any clunky exposition. Compare that to this new movie, where they felt the need to bluntly tell us who each character is, and it's not because these characters are just so complex that they need to be explained. We have Bible Guy, who we're told loves his Bible, even though he's never seen reading one and he only makes one or two passing references to end times in the entire movie. Then we have Tourette's Guy, who twitches and swears a lot because he has Tourette's Syndrome, which movies seem to think is just is a funny disorder that makes people swear uncontrollably. And it doesn't even make sense in context because I don't think somebody with Tourette's this bad as this guy would even be allowed in the military. We, we have White Guy, who I keep forgetting is in this movie. And then we have Bald Guy, who's supposed to be the funny one because he's played by Keegan-Michael Key from the 
comedy duo, Key and Peele, who are responsible for some of the most unfunny and poorly timed comedy sketches on YouTube. Uh, you can't call us unfunny. Yeah, we're professional comedians who have our own TV show. That doesn't mean anything. Lily Singh has a TV show. Hey man, you can't say anything bad about Lily. Yeah, she's a bisexual woman of color. If you criticize her, you're a homophobe. And a sexist. And a racist. And a homophobe. I already said that. Said why? You're a homophobe. Or are you calling a homophobe? I'm not. Oh, they're stuck in one of their unfunny, poorly timed sketches that goes on for too long. Good. Sexist? Don't you call me a sexist, you homophobe? I'm not a homophobe, you're a racist! I'm no racist, you transphobe. I ain't no transphobe, you fatphobe! Fatphobe? Wait, that's a thing? It's what you are, so yeah! And then we have Black Guy, who's the cool one, I guess. Black Guy introduces Quinn to Ave One, and what they did to get thrown into military prison or whatever. None of it really matters, except that Black Guy shot his commanding officer. We'll learn more about that later. Now, this scene is not just a showcase of Shane Black's lazy writing, but also his tedious, annoying, sophomoric brand of humor. God makes people. I mean, why, why do you think people make war? Why, 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 why do we make war? Because Because we that's it, because we f***ing One thing you'll notice if you watch this movie is that half of the characters in it are, are the comic relief. And they spend the bulk of the runtime bantering with each other. Like, just like the college dude bro version of Ghostbusters 2016. If you watch the original Predator, they only had one comic relief. And that was Shane Black's character, Hawkins. Who died early on so the movie could have a consistent tone of horror when it mattered. Which is something we don't get in this movie, because it feels the need to be constantly funny for some reason. But it's not funny because the comedy is character-driven, and that the, the, the characters have to play off each other, but this is not that much to play off of because these characters are all so flat and one-dimensional. And while the original Predator didn't have the deepest characters, there was a lot more distinguishing them than what we got in this movie. Which was, there was Hawkins, the nerdy one, who was always cracking bad jokes for which he needed to explain the punchline. There was Blaine, the tobacco-chewing, cowboy hat-wearing big guy who ain't got time to bleed. I ain't got time to bleed. There was Mac, the first guy to see the Predator and who loses his mind in fear, but still swears to avenge Blaine after it kills him. There was Billy, the quiet one with traffic skills who sacrificed himself so the others could escape. And there's Dylan, the, the conniving CIA agent who struggles to recall his military training. Again, not the deepest characters, but they each have a place in the movie's character web. In this movie, these guys on the, the bus each have one distinguishing characteristic, which is established in this scene, and they didn't get any other characterization for the rest of the movie. So they're essentially interchangeable, except for Black Guy who gets one scene explaining his backstory later. But it doesn't really have anything to do with the plot, so I don't even know why they bother. Anyway, we then cut to Project Stargazer, which is some kind of secret government laboratory. I have a brown star Shane Black can gaze at. The government guy takes do uh, Dr. Woman down to the elevator to, and they see some Predator shit, and then the Predator himself, laying unconscious on a table. Bad Black guy is there and he invites her in. Dr. Woman and this other scientist guy go through the decamination de and talk about nothing. Then Dr. Woman argues with the bad black guy about uh, Predator being an inaccurate name for the alien. Tracks its prey, exploits weakness, seems to, well, enjoy it. Like a game. That's not a Predator, that's a sports hunter. Sorry? A Predator kills its prey to survive. Not all Predators, sweetheart. So, bad black guy explains they found the Predator in his escape pod in Mexico. And the scientist guy explains they sequenced his genome and found he has human DNA. Which is why they brought Dr. Woman in, because she's like a biologist or something. You want to know someone an alien. Then Dr. Woman sees Quinn's picture on an iPad, and Bad Black Guy tells her he's the one who made first contact with the Predator. So Dr. Woman wants to talk to him. We cut back to Quinn on the bus. Bald Guy tells a sixth grade joke. How do you circumcise a homeless man? Here it goes. Kick your mom in the chin. <laughs> Then Black Eye asks Quinn why he's going to prison with them. Quinn tells them that he had a run-in with a space alien, and they all laugh. Then we see the other Predator spaceship emerge from a wormhole. 
just never explains why it took him so long to get to Earth, especially since the ending of the movie makes it clear that this is the big predator knew where the little predator was going, because that was the whole point of his mission to stop him from bringing something to Earth. But we'll get to that. So Asperger Kid is screwing around with the Predator's arm thing, and somehow accidentally uses it to remote control the big Predator's spaceship, causing its cloaking device to turn off. Uh, hold on. This is the little Predator's arm thing, right? But Asperger Kid is using it to control the big Predator's spaceship by remote. The same big Predator who's chasing and trying to kill the little Predator, who owns the arm thing Asperger Kid is using. So if that Predator's own arm thing could be used to remote control the big Predator's spaceship, why didn't the little Predator use it to control the big Predator's spaceship when he was being chased? And if one Predator's arm thing could be used to control another Predator's spaceship, can the big Predator use his to control the spaceship that he's chasing? Because if he can, then why doesn't he? This makes no sense. This movie had two writers, and neither of them caught this. Anyway, since Asperger Kid turned off the big Predator's cloak thing, the government is able to detect his spaceship. So they scramble the jets. Back at Project Stargazer, Dr. Woman complains about not being allowed to study this yellow liquid that came from the Predator. A uh, guy tells Bad Black Eye that there's a Predator spaceship incoming, and we see fighter jets chasing after the spaceship. And then we cut back to Project Stargazer where the Predator wakes up and starts killing people including the several armed guards who, for whatever reason, don't shoot at him until he's looking at them. I understand that choreographing fight scenes is hard, so you don't have to get it right. I mean, it's not like that's the very thing we watch action movies for or anything like that. Uh, so do you know why they use this terrible looking CGI blood in movies when practical blood effects which have been around for decades look so much better? It's so they can easily remove the blood for when they need to get past sensors in the foreign market. Aren't movies magical? So while the Predator is busy killing everyone, Dr. Woman grabs one of the yellow vials and tries to escape the laboratory. But the door won't open until she goes through the decontamination. So she takes her clothes off, but then the Predator sees her and comes into the decontamination room and finds her cowering naked, but then decides to ignore her. Now, this doesn't make sense either. It was established in the first movie that the Predators wouldn't kill anyone who was unarmed, just because they, there was no sport in doing so. But the Predator in that movie was hunting. This one isn't. This Predator is trying to escape a government laboratory. He should assume every human he sees is a potential threat, even if they're unarmed, because they, they can alert other humans to his location, or pick up a weapon and use it on him, or use their knowledge of him to track him down later. He has no reason to let Dr. Woman live, and if he were smart, he wouldn't especially considering he just killed at least one unarmed scientist. But I guess the movie wanted to remind us that the Predator doesn't kill helpless people, and they, they couldn't think of a better way to do that, so that's what we get. So the Predator pries the door open and kills a bunch of guards, then finds one of the Predator masks and uses it to remotely see through the eyes of his own mask in a Spurger Kid's bedroom, because apparently they can do that now, and sees the name of the middle school and decides that's where he needs to go. The bus arrives at Project Stargazer, I guess because that's where they were bringing the prisoners for some reason. And the guards stop it and tell them to wait because there's been a breach. There's been a breach. Meanwhile, Dr. Woman runs around with a tranquilizer gun as the Predator continues to rampage through the facility. A scientist guy tells Dr. Woman to not let the Predator get away, to which she replies, Not my space animal. Not my space animal. What's that supposed to mean? Then Quinn and the other prisoners see the Predator running around on the roof, and they all realize Quinn was telling the truth. We gotta get off this thing, we gotta move. Brother, it's a bus. It moves. So then, Bald Guy starts making fun of Tourette's Guy's mom. So Tourette's Guy gets up and starts strangling him. I'm pretty sure prisoners are chained to their seats on buses specifically to prevent this sort of thing. But the script needed this to happen, and they couldn't have possibly written it so that something else happened. So, just, so don't question it. The guards open the door and try to break up the fight, but then the, the, all the prisoners, who aren't, in, who aren't restrained in any way, beat up the guards and take their guns and handcuff keys, then steal the bus. 
So for no discernible reason, the prisoners decide they want to chase after the Predator. Uh, let me point out that Quinn is the only one who even sort of has a reason to want to. That being so he can avenge his army friends. Remember, at this point, Quinn still has no idea that his son found the Predator's mask and arm thing. And he doesn't know that the Predator is looking for them. So the only conceivable reason why he would want to chase the Predator at this point is to avenge his army buddies. And none of the other prisoners have any reason to chase it. So it's like they're just chasing the Predator because the plot needs them to in order for the movie to happen. While that's going on, Dr. Woman chases the Predator onto the roof. But then the big Predator spaceship flies overhead, and the Predator realizes he needs to get moving. As the Predator runs away, Dr. Woman chases him and jumps off the roof, onto the roof of the bus, because this biologist who the government picked up off the street is some kind of action hero now, because every female character has to be a strong female character now, even when it makes no sense. You think those woke points are gonna offset this movie making fun of people with Tourette's Syndrome? Quinn tries to shoot at the Predator, but the Predator shoots a thing at the bus and pops one of the tires, causing Quinn to fall out, and also causing Dr. Woman to accidentally shoot a tranquilizer dart into her own foot. The Predator gets away, and Ava Woman gets out of the bus. Quinn tells Dr. Woman to jump, and he'll catch her, but then he sees a guard approaching, so he runs away, causing Dr. Woman to comically fall on the ground. Then Black Eye sees some conveniently placed motorcycles. Get to the top of F*** off. While that's going on, the fighter jets shoot missiles at the big Predator spaceship, uh, but he shoots them down. Then a guard wa uh, walks up to Dr. Woman and gets instructions from Bad Black Guy to kill her and retrieve the, any contraband she might have on her, which I guess means the yellow vial she took. But before he can shoot, Quinn and Black Guy come riding up on motorcycles and knock him out. So Quinn picks up Dr. Woman, and then he and all the, all the prisoners ride off. Then we see a truck with guards in it and the Predator jumps on board and cuts everyone up. The driver hears the commotion and asks if everything is okay, so the Predator actually picks up a severed arm and uses it to give him a thumbs up. It's a good thing that severed arm didn't have any blood on it, or the driver might have been suspicious. I also like how it switches from a left arm to a right arm between cuts. So I guess the Predator just sits down to ride the truck to wherever it's going. I guess because he somehow knows where it's going, and it happens to be going where he needs it to go. Meanwhile, the big predator lands his spaceship and has his two alien dogs sniff something. I guess because using dogs is still the best way to track someone, even for a super advanced alien race capable of interstellar travel. Quinn and the gang go to a motel somewhere to hide out, and Quinn goes outside to hang out with Black Guy, who tells him his backstory. It turns out the commanding officer he shot was actually himself, but he missed. I missed even though he has the scar to show that he clearly didn't miss. So I guess this guy is supposed to be s idol, but he doesn't act like it at all throughout the entire movie up until he sacrifices himself at the end. Uh, spoilers, I guess. You know, a guy named F. Scott Fitzgerald once said, Action is character. This means characterization comes from what a character does, not what we're told about them. The movie just tells us this guy is s idol, but doesn't show it through his actions. And the fact that he's suicidal has no bearing on the plot, nor does it inform the way he interacts with any of the other characters. So it's like the movie is giving us detail about this character and his backstory, but it's inconsequential because it, it, it doesn't do anything with it. Where I come from, this is called bad writing. And it also raises the question of why Black Guy was on the prison bus if it was himself that he shot. You usually don't go to prison for trying to kill yourself. I know because I tried after watching this movie. Did they just put him on the prison bus because he's black? At least they didn't make him sit in the back. Back in the motel room, the guys put a bunch of shit around Dr. Woman before she wakes up in an attempt to make her feel more comfortable. I guess it's an effective way to shut these guys don't understand women, or are really just normal people at all. But these guys are apparently so socially inept that it raises the question of how they even got into the military in the first place. Dr. Woman wakes up and grabs the shotgun, and Bald Guy gloats about it because he made a bet that she would. Then Quinn tries to take the gun from Dr. Woman, and she pulls the trigger, but it isn't loaded. So then Dr. Woman runs for the door, but Quinn tells her the government is gonna kill her. Then we get a forced comedy bit from Tourette's Guy. What? How you doing? 
You know, you just said eat your pussy. No, I, you don't. No, you said eat my pussy. What the f is wrong with that? Hey, sheesh, you're pushy. Just tell her you have Tourette's, you idiot. Dr. Woman asks Quinn why the government is trying to kill her, and he says it's probably because of the vial she stole from the laboratory. So Dr. Woman decides she has to stay with these guys, and she explains that she was in the laboratory when the Predator escaped, and that's looking for something. Then Quinn says he took the Predator's mask and arm thing so he could prove that he existed, and he realizes the Predator is going to his house to look for them. Uh, hold on. How does he know that? He sent the package to a P.O. box. At this point, he doesn't know that his package got sent to his old address instead. So he has no reason to believe the Predator would go to his old house to find it. This movie had two writers. Back at Asperger Kid's house, Asperger Kid puts on the mask and, for no reason, it shows him a video of the Predator's gene splicing themselves. Really, the thing just starts making noise, so he puts it on and it starts playing a video without him doing anything to make it. Why is that video even on the mask anyway? Why would the Predator have this random video downloaded onto his mask? Or is it like alien YouTube or something? Does the Predator get mobile data light years from his home planet? Quinn lets himself into Asperger Kid's house, but it turns out he and Asperger Kid's mom are divorced, so she tries to kick him out. Gee, I'm sure glad the state decided to put Quinn's special needs son in the custody of his mother who threatens to cut him. Quinn says he's looking for a package, and he goes into the basement to look for it, but he sees that Asperger Kid took the mask and arm thing. Quinn says the whole reason he tried to send it to the, the, the P.O. box is so that he wouldn't put Asperger Kid and his mom in danger. We then cut to Asperger Kid wearing the Predator mask while out trick-or-treating. Then we cut back to Quinn and his mom walking back upstairs, where the prisoners are hanging out in the living room. They, expl they explain to her that the, a space alien is looking for Asperger Kid, and she just instantly believes them and grabs her hunting rifle. But Quinn takes it from her and tells her to get back in the kitchen. Because this is a manly movie for men and there's only room for one strong female character. Then he says he's, he's gonna go find his son, but the other guys say they don't want to, to help him because they're fugitives on the run. So Quinn tells them to just stay there. But then Black Guy gets up to follow him, but none of the other guys are going. So he asks Mom about Quinn. So she lists off his bulleted badass points list about how he's an army ranger sniper with all these medals and 13 confirmed kills. Sounds like he probably take care of himself. Yeah, yeah, Jesus yeah, yeah. Christ. So Black Guy calls them p****s and walks out. But then Bible Guy follows him for no reason other than because he called him a p****. He called me a p and nobody calls me p so... Then Bald Guy gets up and goes too just because. And then the Tourette's guy and white guy go because Bald Guy told them to. And that's it. I know this is the movie is trying to play this up for laughs, but the fact that they acknowledge it doesn't change the fact that these guys have no stakes in the plot and no reason to participate in it. In the original Predator, the Special Forces guys each had a stake in what happened because they were stranded in the un unforgiving jungle and had to rely on each other to survive while space alien haunted them one by one. But in, in this movie, these guys have no reason to go along with Quinn. They could just walk away from the plot completely and go on with their lives, never having to worry about the Predator ever again because none of them have any personal stakes of what happens. It's not even like they're called upon to save the world or something, because as far as any of them know, the Predator just wants his gear back. What do they care if he gets it or not? What do they care if it kills a Spurger kid? So these characters have no motivation, and the only reason they go along with Quinn is because the plot needs them to. This movie had two writers. So Quinn goes into his camper to get his rifle, and then we get another forced attempt at humor. Let's <laughs> me in the face with an aardvark. Avon pours into the camper and they get ready to save a Spurger kid. We then cut to a Spurger kid continuing to trick or treat in the Predator mask, when he's spotted by the two bullies from earlier, but they, they don't really do anything. Again. A Spurger kid goes up to a house with the address 420, because Shane Black wrote this, and rings the doorbell, but nobody answers. As he walks away, a redneck steps out onto his deck and throws a beer can at him, causing the Predator mask to deploy a tiny plasma gun thing, which shoots at the redneck, blowing up him and his house. Quinn and Dr. Woman hear the explosion and stop driving, I guess because they were in a car even though that was never established. 
Then Asperger Kid scares the two bullies away with an aggressive gesture. Not- not caring at all that he just killed a guy. Does he have Asperger Syndrome or is he a sociopath? In any case, Asperger Kid inexplicably drops the mask and walks away. Why? Uh, then we cut to Bible Guy driving the camper, and he hears on the police radio that they just conveniently have in there for some reason, about how a house just blew up. So he calls up Quinn and tells him about it, so Quinn starts driving there. On the way there, Quinn calls up Black Guy, who's now driving a police car. How and when did he get that? What the f*** is going on in this movie? So then, they somehow figure out that Asperger Kid is going to the local baseball timing. Well, we cut to Asperger Kid standing around when the dog who barked at him earlier shows up. Yeah, I remember him. I guess he's friendly now. But then, the big, the big Predator's alien dogs show up. Wait, I thought they were looking for the other Predator. So Quinn and Dr. Woman, Black Guy, and the others all conveniently show up at the same time and start shooting at the alien dog. Uh, Black Guy has a grenade launcher now, and just like the police car, I have no idea where he got it. None of the weapons, which they just inexplicably seem to have now, have any effect on the dogs. So Quinn runs into the bleachers, and one of the alien dogs chases him. B uh, Black Guy throws the grenade launcher to him, Quinn shoots a grenade into the alien dog's mouth, and then it blows up. Then, uh, as the other guys continue to shoot at the other alien dog, Black Guy just calmly walks up to it and shoots it in the head. And this time, the bullet seems to have an effect. But then the alien dog gets back up, and it stops attacking. I guess because they damage its brain. So they just decide to ignore the giant man-eating alien dog. Then the Predator shows up and pulls Bible Guy out of the camper. Remember, the last time we saw the Predator was when he got in the back of that truck, and killed Dave when I rode it to somewhere unspecified. So I guess the truck was just going to where Asperger Kid happened to be. Why, though? Why would the truck go there, and how did he know that's where it was going? The Predator points his laser thing at Asperger Kid and gestures them to put their guns down. Tourette's guy starts swearing, which distracts the Predator, so then they shoot at him, causing him to drop Bible Guy, and then they all run into the school. Now, if you're paying attention, you might have noticed that the Predator actually had no idea where Asperger Kid was. He only knew where the school was, and it's just by complete coincidence that Asperger Kid happens to be there when the Predator shows up. This movie had two writers. So the Predator chases them through the school, when Quinn suddenly gets the idea to simply give the Predator what he's looking for. And they somehow know that the Predator is looking for this little doohickey that comes off the, the arm thing, rather than the, the arm thing itself. So Quinn takes it off, and then the Predator runs up and grabs him by the throat instead of just killing him on the spot, giving Quinn the chance to show the Predator that he has the thing. The Predator takes it, but then the big Predator shows up and grabs the Predator through the window. Then we get our first good look at the big Predator. I'm not going to comment on how it makes no biological sense for such a large biped to walk onto Jim Gray's feet. The big Predator kills the little Predator in a totally one-sided fight. And this creature, who has always been portrayed as nigh-unstoppable bad for the past three decades, is defeated with almost no effort. The big predator rips the little predator's head off, and then he just stands there and watches as Quinn and the gang drive off in the camper. He watches a hologram on his arm thing, then disappears as the police show up. Back at the house, Mom hangs out with some government guys, so I guess they're waiting to see if Quinn comes back so they can capture him. But that was never established, which seems to be a running theme in this movie. Quinn calls Mom and tells her he found a Sperger kid. And then she soaks the phone in water so the government guys can't take it from her and use it to find out where Quinn is. Then we see Bad Black Guy walking into a room where they have the dead Predator's body. This other guy tells him about the big Predator, then black, the Bad Black Guy speculates why the, the Predators came there. You know what I think? I think this one went rogue, a runner. And the big one? He's a tracker. Sent to take that one out. Some kind of interstellar cops and robbers. And now he's going after that missing ship and whatever's on board. The other guy suddenly gets a text from somebody telling him about the package that was sent to Quinn's house. So now they know Asperger Kid has the Predator gear, so they figure out that if they can catch Asperger Kid, they can use him to find the ship. Then we cut to some farm somewhere, 
and I guess our heroes are just hanging out here. Does this farm belong to one of them? White Guy explains to Quinn that Bad Guy and Tourette's Guy are actually war buddies. Not that it matters. Then Quinn talks to a Spurger kid. So I never grew up, you know, the way you wanted. I'll tell you a secret. Truth is, kid, I never grew up the way I wanted. Wow, such dialogue. Then we cut to Bible Guy hitting on Dr. Woman in the camper. We got so much stuff in common, you know, like... You like music, I like music, you like music, right? Dr. Woman looks through a microscope at the yellow liquid she took from the lab. I guess because she just happens to have a microscope with her. Then she talks to a Quinn and tells him the scientists at Project Stargazer found the yellow liquid in the Predator. I guess just based on what she saw through the microscope, she figured out that the Predators are trying to hybridize themselves with human DNA. And that's why the Predators go around collecting skulls and spines from people. You know, ever since the first movie, it's been clear that the Predators hunt humans for sport and collect skulls as trophies. We even see a Predator trophy room in Predator 2, which this movie even acknowledges is still canon. They've been here before. 87, 97. In Predators, the third movie which nobody remembers, they even abduct people and put them on a game preserve planet just so they could hunt them there. It has never been about collecting DNA. It's always been about the hunt and collecting trophies, which the culture evidently sees as some kind of status symbols. If that wasn't the case, then the Predators at the end of Predator 2 wouldn't have let Danny Glover live and given him an old flintlock pistol as a token of respect for defeating one of their own. And they certainly wouldn't f around using such inefficient tactics to kill people when they could make it very easy for themselves by just dropping poison gas from their spaceships onto cities or something, and then just pick out the best corpses at their own leisure. Or better yet, they could just abduct a small handful of humans, then domesticate them and farm them on their own planet, and not have to fly light years out into space just to collect some spinal fluid. She's pulling this out of her Did you not see the new Predator? It's evolving. No, it's not. Individuals don't evolve. Populations evolve over successive generations through the passing on of genetic mutations selected for by environmental pressures and mating preferences. What the big predator is doing is metamorphosing, which is when an individual organism changes from one form to another. Stop misrepresenting evolution in movies, you scientifically illiterate Hollywood morons. So anyway, I guess the Predators collect human spines so they can get the spinal fluid because they're trying to splice human DNA with their own DNA. And we'll find out more about that later, and I'll carefully explain why it's stupid and makes no sense. For now, uh, l listen to Dr. Woman say the dumbest thing that's ever been said in any movie. You know, a lot of experts say that being on the spectrum isn't really a disorder. That's actually the next step in the evolutionary chain. If anybody out there needs me to explain why this is stupid, you're beyond help. Then Bible Guy comes walking up with the alien dog behind him, and it turns out it's friendly now since Black Guy shot it out of a chunk of its brain. So I, they decide to keep it around in case it turns out to be useful, because none of them consider the possibility that it might be microchipped and the big predator might come looking for it. But then a government helicopter appears, because they knew Quinn and the gang went to the farm somehow. So Dr. Woman grabs a grenade and tells the alien dog to go fetch it, and it does. I guess because alien dogs act exactly like Earth dogs. Then Bad Black Guy steps out of the helicopter and asks Quinn where the, the arm thing is. Then it cuts to them kicking Quinn into the barn. Then Bad Black Guy has Dr. Woman tied up and explains to her that the Predators are coming to Earth with increasing frequency because climate change is going to lead to the extinction of the human species in a generation or two, so the Predators want to collect as much human DNA as possible so they can splice it with themselves. How long before climate change renders this planet unlivable? Two generations? One? That's why their visits are increasing. They're trying to snap up all of our best DNA before we're gone. Adapt themselves with it and then move in. Okay, so let me get this straight. The Predators want to collect human DNA because humans will soon be extinct thanks to climate change. This implies that humans will be unsuited to survive on Earth once it becomes too hot. But the Predators want human DNA so they can make themselves better at surviving on Earth the climate of which is about to become unsuitable to humans. 
So the predator's plan is to make themselves more like humans so they can survive in an environment that humans won't be able to survive in. Does anybody else see the holes in this plan? This movie had two writers. Alright, f*** this. I need a smoke break. Oh my god! Get off my lawn! Damn kids. Look at this mess they made. What's this? They wrote their names? Charles J. Harris, Echidna, Jan Guevara, John Wellington, Joseph Reagan, Keith Paul, Lex Reardon, McSquizzy, Michael Lowe, Old Gurton, Zanski, Pete T. Paco, Ricky Baruga, The Sauce God, Valentin, Giovanni, Maximilian, Sebastiano, George Fairfax, Vilger Orson II, Victor Alexandrovich Gontar. Well, that's convenient. Now I know what names to give to the police. Hey, what happened to Key and Peel? Hey, do you know where Key and Peel went? Now. Well, if you see him, tell him I hate him. So it turns out the little predator came to Earth to deliver a thing that would enable humans to fight off the oncoming predator invasion. And that the big predator was chasing him to stop him from doing that. And now he's looking for the little predator spaceship so he could take the package. So I guess it turns out the little predator was on the human side all along. But that he still went around killing humans. So you just love twists that make no sense in hindsight? So these two government guys try to beat information out of Quinn. Then we cut to Mom trying to stop other government guys from ransacking Asperger Kid's bedroom. But then the big predator shows up and kills them. Mom runs away. Then the big predator looks at Asperger Kid's stuff and... I just realized the big predator has robot scanning vision even though he's not wearing a mask. The big predator looks at Asperger Kid's stuff and sees a map that Asperger Kid drew, which he just assumes will lead him to the little predator's spaceship. And while he's looking at that, a government guy sees Asperger Kid draw, uh, drawing another map at the same time, and they realize he knows where the spaceship is, so they take him. This kid is smart enough to figure out how to use a piece of alien equipment by playing around with it for a few minutes. And he goes and does a thing like that. Quinn sees bad black guy take Asperger Kid into the, the helicopter, so he does this martial arts shit and kills both of them. Uh, he could have just done that any time, but I guess he decided to wait until they were taking his son away. Then another guy is about to shoot Dr. Woman when the alien dog comes upstairs and pukes up the grenade Dr. Woman threw earlier. So Dr. Woman hits the guy with a the chair, then pulls the pin and shoves the grenade into the guy's vest, blowing him up. She couldn't have possibly predicted that the alien dog would show up by pure chance and puke up the grenade that she threw earlier when she needed it. So I guess just she just threw that grenade because it was just the closest throwable object she could find. Where did they even get these weapons? Then Black Eye decides it's time to escape, so he beats up his guard as well. So after everyone conveniently beats up their respective guards at the same time, Quinn goes out to the camper to sh** out the little metal invisibility ball he swallowed at the beginning of the movie. Then Quinn fig figures the government guy is going to find the, the Predator spaceship with a Sperger kid. And then Bible guy, bald guy, white guy, and Tourette's guy suddenly show up with a helicopter. Wh where the f*** are they getting these things? It's like the writers needed to get the characters from A to B, but they couldn't think of how to do that, so they just had them get vehicles out of nowhere. This is seriously one of the most nonsensical movies I have ever seen. And I don't, I don't know if it's because of studio-mandated reshoots, or if the script was just that bad to begin with. I don't know, maybe it was explained in a scene that got cut. Anyway, they used the helicopter to follow the alien dog back to the spaceship. And apparently, the spaceship is just a short helicopter ride away, even though I thought it crashed somewhere in Mexico. Did the writers forget the beginning of their own movie? At the spaceship, the government has already set up an electric fence, and Bad Black Guy brings a Sperger Kid up to the spaceship, and Quinn watches through a rifle scope as he opens the door, because a Sperger Kid just somehow knows how to do that because he figured out how to understand the Predator's language in the few hours he spent with the arm thing. No, I'm not exaggerating, that's actually this movie's explanation for how the kid knows all this, this how all this stuff works. He deciphered an alien language in a day, because Asperger Syndrome gives you superpowers. F*** this movie. So the door opens, and Bad Black Guy, the other government guy, and Asperger Kid enter the spaceship, which shows absolutely no signs of damage even though it crashed. 
And they do so without any kind of protection because they're apparently not concerned about getting infected by alien bacteria or vaporized by an alien security system. Uh, so the interior of the ship looks nothing like how it did on, in Predator 2, which I remind you is still canon according to this movie. Put the translator into the mainframe, download everything. You can't use a hard drive on a Windows PC if it's formatted for Mac. How are you going to download data from an alien spaceship? So then they find the thing the camera zoomed in on at the beginning of the movie. What the hell's inside there? It's probably a Project Stargazer, that's what the f it is. <laughs> then the bad black guy gets a call on the radio telling him somebody tripped the wire sensors. A Spurger kid says it's his dad coming to rescue him, and bad black guy laughs at him for being stupid enough to trip the sensor until he realizes Quinn is creating a diversion. Just then, Quinn shows up using the invisibility ball and knocks Bad Black Guy out, then shoots the other guy in the eye with a tranquilizer dart, killing him in front of a Spurger kid, who, again, doesn't seem at all bothered by the sight of death. Told ya. Quinn takes Bad Black Guy hostage, then the other guys show up to kill the other government guys. Quinn comes out of the spaceship with Bad Black Guy and tells him to, to tell his men to put their guns down but he doesn't go along with it. Captain McKenna doesn't lower his weapon in the next 10 seconds, shoot the kid's knees out. That would be. And my guy's got this place covered on every angle. That's a funny story. See, I don't give a 10. Bad black guy starts counting down, but then the big predator shows up and blows white guy's arm off. He screams and fires off a flare, and bad black guy uses the distraction to escape from Quinn. A firefight ensues. Quinn and a Spurger kid hide behind a car, and Quinn gives a Spurger kid the invisibility ball telling him it'll make him invisible. But then the big predator jumps down and kills a bunch of government guys, then goes into the spaceship and somehow uses the government's translator machine to tell everyone the following. Then a countdown starts. So I guess just for shits and giggles, the big predator is going to give the humans a chance to get away, just so he can hunt them. Which I guess is sort of in character for a predator, except that's not what he came here to do and it's kind of stupid of him. Anyway, the big predator wants them to give him McKenna, which is Quinn's last name. So Quinn and Bad Black Eye declare a truce and decide they have to stick together. Okay, so we split up. 12 different directions. McKenna's the one he wants. No, 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 no. We'll stay together. It'll take us one by one. He's right. It's their M.O. Bro, He's right though. The Predator just wants McKenna, so if they split up, he'll go after him and the rest of them can get away. And if the logic is he'll just hunt the rest of them down after he has McKenna, they could just drop their guns. If Dr. Woman and Bad Black Eye apparently know so much about how the Predators think, then they should also know that they don't kill people who aren't armed. So they could just leave their guns behind and split up, and then they'll all be safe. But the movie wants us to have a big fight in the woods, so I guess they're not gonna do the smart thing. Son of a bitch, you must have hacked the vehicle. Wait, what? How do you hack a vehicle, let alone several of them at the same time? Does the big predator have a magic button on the spaceship or something? What, the plot just need them to walk through the woods, but the writers couldn't think of a reason for them to do it, so they just come up with a quick throwaway line to cover it up? So because they can't drive, they have to walk to the helicopter which Quinn and the gang left two clicks away on the other side of the forest. So Bad Black Guy and the uh, packs the Predator gear into the duffel bag when suddenly the alien dog appears. Bad Black Guy pulls out his gun but Bible Guy and Dr. Woman tell him to stop him from shooting it even though it's been well established at this point that bullets don't harm it. Dr. Woman throws a, a thing and the, and the alien dog chases it but then they trap it inside a truck. The big predator finishes setting up a bunch of explosives inside the spaceship, then leaves. So then Avon is in the f***ing woods. Bad Black Eye now has a predator style shoulder gun thing, which I think he took from the little predator's body, but that wasn't shown. The big predator blows up the spaceship, then Bad Black Eye asks a Spurger kid how, how to make the predator mask shoot like it did when it blew up the house. A Spurger kid explains that you don't control it, it just shoots automatically when the wearer gets attacked. Which sounds like an incredibly stupid design. I mean, what if it interprets some redneck throwing a beer can as an attack? 
Oh, wait. So then a guy thinks he hears something, so he throws the predator's pointy thing, but then it comes back and cuts his hand off. So bad black guy shoots him to make him stop screaming. But then the big predator shows up and bites another guy's head off. Then they all start shooting at it, which, by now, they should all know doesn't work. They run away again, then Tourette's guy and Bald guy decide they're gonna use themselves as bait. So everyone hides with the guns and explosives and they wait. The big predator eventually shows up, so Tourette's guy and Bald guy get him to chase them, but then it shoots a thing at the guy and cuts him in half. And then they all start shooting at him again. Dr. Woman picks up the mask, and then the big predator shoots at it, causing it to turn on and shoot at him knocking them into, into the spot where they set up their explosives. So then they try to blow them up and light them on fire. Then Tourette's guy inexplicably jumps onto the big predator, who's on fire, and starts stabbing him. And then, in a shot that goes by so fast that you'll miss it if you blink, bad black guy's shoulder thing just randomly decides to shoot him in the head. And that's the death of this major character. It's like they couldn't think of what to do with him for the end of the movie, so they just decide to get rid of him at the most random time just so they wouldn't have to worry about it. So the big predator throws Tourette's guy and impales him on a tree branch. Then the big predator shoots a thing at Bald's guy and makes his guts spill out. And then he falls off a cliff into a river or something. Then the movie tries to have a dramatic moment where Tourette's guy and Bald guy decide to end each other's pain or something by shooting each other. And they both happen to pull the trigger at the exact same time. And if you look closely, you can see they shot each other in the chest, which kills them instantly. I guess because that kills you faster than getting impaled through the torso or split open like a lobster. I don't know why I expected medical accuracy from this movie. So everyone runs, and then the big predator shows up again. I guess now they finally realize they can't fight him. So Quinn goes up to the big predator to sacrifice himself, thinking he's the one the big predator wants. But the big predator just throws him. It turns out he wanted Quinn's son, a Spurger kid, because remember, he said he wanted McKenna, and they're both named McKenna. Let me just pause here because this is where it all comes together into a singularity of stupid. And I just want to make sure you all appreciate it. So here's the plot. The predators come to Earth so they can harvest DNA from the toughest human warriors. They want this DNA so they can splice it with themselves to make themselves better at surviving in hostile environments. I already explained how, according to this movie, climate change will make the Earth unsuitable for humans in a generation or two, so it makes no sense for the predators to splice themselves with human DNA if they want to survive on Earth. But also according to this movie, people with Asperger's syndrome are the next step in human evolution. The big predator said McKenna is a true warrior, but it turned out he was talking about Asperger kid, so the Predators see people with Asperger Syndrome as true warriors. He captures Asperger Kid, presumably so he can harvest DNA from him and splice it with himself. Let me clarify that. The Predators want to harvest DNA from the best humans to splice with themselves. And the best humans are those with Asperger Syndrome. So the Predators want Asperger DNA so they can splice it with themselves and give themselves Asperger Syndrome so they can have Rain Man powers. The Predators want Asperger Syndrome. The Predators are trying to steal our Asperger Syndrome. That is, without hyperbole, the actual plot of this movie. Can I just comment on something? This right here. If somebody got hit hard enough to send them flying 20 or 30 feet through the air, that's equivalent to getting hit by a speeding car. The big predator smacked her in the head, her skull should be caved in, and even if he didn't hit her head, the whiplash should have broken her neck. She should be dead, or at the very least too badly injured to get up again. And understand, I'm not complaining about this being unrealistic in a movie about space aliens hunting people. I'm complaining because when we see characters who are supposed to be ordinary humans getting hit like that and being completely unharmed, all that does is kill the tension because now we've established that the characters can't actually be injured and are therefore not in any real danger thanks to plot armor. Anyway, the big predator grabs a Spurger kid and brings him to a spaceship, which I guess just happens to be right there. I remember how the big predator was trying to find the little predator spaceship? Well, I guess it was just in walking distance of where he landed his own ship this whole time. How convenient. 
So Quinn, Black Guy, and Bible Guy all run and jump onto the spaceship as it's taking off, leaving Dr. Woman behind on the cliff. They slide around for a while. Then, as then Asperger Kid tells Quinn over the radio that the big predator is about to turn on a force field, because he just knows that's what he's doing somehow. So Quinn ducks under the force field while Black Guy jumps over it. Uh, but Bible Guy just stands there shooting at nothing, and the force field cuts his legs off. Then he falls off the ship and presumably dies. Then Black Guy sees what I guess is some kind of space jet engine or something, so he decides to sacrifice himself by jumping into it, blowing it up. And I guess that's the, the conclusion to his character arc. It was briefly mentioned that he tried to kill himself once, then it never came up again until he finally did it. I almost appreciate that they didn't try in vain to give him a dramatic, drawn-out death scene, like we're expected to care. It's like they knew. So all of the prisoners are dead now. When you think about it, almost everyone who died in this movie died because Quinn didn't pay for his P.O. box. All this death and destruction is the fault of our hero. By the way, considering the kinds of stresses a spaceship has to endure, one would think that it wouldn't be that easily damaged. Then Quid slides down the inside of the force field and makes his way to the, the hatch. And he just happens to know how to open it, I guess because he watched a Spurger kid do it once from far away. And I guess the big predator spaceship has the same door code, which is convenient. Everything's convenient. Quinn shoots at the big predator, then the big predator shoots some kind of grappling hook at him, and it pulls him up to the ceiling somehow, even though the cable went straight from his wrist to Quinn, and we never saw it connect to the ceiling in any way, so I don't understand how that works. I also don't understand why he didn't just shoot Quinn with another one of those blade things that cut people in half. Anyway, the spaceship is crashing, so Quinn shoots the, the ceiling where the cable's attached and it falls down, because the spaceship is made out of flimsy materials. And then he falls out the door and dangles from the cable until he falls and gets caught in a tree, somehow without snapping his foot off. The spaceship crashes, then Quinn and the Big Predator shoot at each other, then the Big Predator grabs Quinn and, instead of taking the opportunity to break his neck or something, just throws him. But then, Dr. Woman jumps on his back. I have no idea how she managed to catch up to the flying spaceship on foot, but the movie clearly doesn't want me to think about it, so I won't. Dr. Woman shoots the Big Predator several times in the head, dazing him long enough for Quinn to push him off a cliff. And then the alien dog conveniently shows up yet again, having somehow escaped from the truck they trapped him in earlier, and drops something. Then a Spurger kid turns on the force field which cuts the Big Predator's arm off. Then Dr. Woman throws the thing the dog dropped to Quinn, and the Big Predator jumps at Quinn and tries to shoot him, but then the dog bites him, distracting him long enough for Quinn to pick up the Big Predator's severed arm, stick the thing in the thing, and shoot it at the Big Predator, blowing him up. Then Quinn and Dr. Woman walk up to the Big Predator and shoot him in the face. And this time the bullets actually work on him, now that the plot says they should, so he dies. Then Quinn, Dr. Woman, and Asperger Kid pack up some random sh**, which I guess belong to the prisoners. Then we cut to Quinn walking around a military science facility or something, where a scientist guy tells him they retrieved some cargo that jettisoned itself from the Little Predator spaceship before the Big Predator blew it up. They go into the room where they're keeping it, and Asperger Kid is there, apparently working for the government now. But then the pod opens up, everyone panics, and then we see the thing rise up from the goo. A scientist guy gets too close and it latches onto him, and then this goofy Power Ranger armor forms around him for a second, then falls off. It turns out this is some kind of anti-predator armor the little predator is trying to give to the humans so they can protect themselves from the predators. But we're never going to see that in action because the movie ends right then and there, and we'll never get a sequel because it barely broke even at the box office. Holy black Jesus, what a dumb movie. The plot has so many holes, it's like they didn't even have a script. I mean, most first drafts aren't this bad. It turns out Fox actually almost completely rewrote the movie after Shane Black's plot synopsis leaked online and everyone hated it. And they reshot huge chunks of it, cutting out entire characters and subplots, and rushing to completely change the third act in only two weeks. What could have possibly gone wrong? So blame Shane Black, blame the Fox executives, blame whatever, I don't care. Just like this video, leave a comment, subscribe, support me on Patreon, and send me your fan art. I'm gonna go lay down. Hmm, I can't help but feel like there's some loose plot thread that needs wrapping up. Oh yeah, 